All right, everyone. So uh, if you'll open your Bibles to Revelation 19, please. Revelation chapter 19. I'll try my best to keep this sermon short. Uh, but it might go long, depending how the Holy Spirit leads me. But I want to uh, keep it short because I'm extremely exhausted myself. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7. This is the marriage supper of the Lamb. One day, sometime in the future, if you are a saved Christian, you and I will go up in heaven and undergo a judgment called the judgment seat of Christ. This judgment seat of Christ is actually the bride's preparation time. Now, we saved Christians are actually known as the bride of Christ. So when we go up there, we're going to go through the judgment seat of Christ because that's where God's going to iron out all the wrinkles of the bride's dress, so to speak. What that means is any wrinkles in our lives, any imperfections, sins, or things that we've let God down in our daily living, the judgment seat of Christ is going to iron all that out. He'll judge it. He'll uh, burn it in the fire. He'll reward us where we need to be rewarded. He'll rebuke us and correct us where we need to be rebuked and corrected. But with all that said and done, now the bride is ready. And here she comes, and she comes out with her best, her best adornment. Now she's perfected in her garment. And at this marriage supper of the Lamb, we say believers are going to enjoy feasting with Jesus Christ. Why that is such a huge big deal is because as anybody would celebrate any wedding on earth and enjoy a good time and a feast, they don't realize how much a billion times better it is up in heaven where there is no sin, no sorrow, everything's perfect, everything's high quality, the food is excellent, your God is obviously excellent and perfect, the fellowship is excellent and perfect, the feast is excellent and perfect, and so much beautiful things to see that you never saw in heaven before. If earth is still praised for its beauty in spite of its corruption and sin, how much more beautiful heaven must be since God created the earth and the heaven? So we have to understand how marvelous it will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I'd like to cover three areas about this bride in verse 7, 8, and 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. I would like to do something unique in my preaching that I didn't do before, but I would like to cover both textual and expository in this message. In other words, I believe they share a relationship when we look at verse 8. In verse 8... Notice that her wedding dress that she's prepared are in three areas. One, it's clean linen. Two, it's white linen. And three, it's fine linen. And I believe that those three in this text, in this textual sermon, will encompass the remaining verses, expository, at 7, 8, and 9. I believe that clean can cover verse 7. And I believe that white is plainly evident at verse 8 itself. And then fine linen will be at verse 9. I would like to examine how that would work. And I would like to talk about the nature. The nature of something that's pure and holy. Fine, clean, and white. Versus something that's impure, something that's worldly, fleshly, or even sinful. Why will I talk about these two natures? Because that's what we have in our world today. And even we ourselves, even if you're a saved Christian, you have these two natures. In these two natures, there's a part that naturally inclines for the impure that doesn't care about holiness, that loves the world and the flesh. 
but you also have something in you that naturally seeks for something pure and holy and righteous. And it hates the wickedness. It hates the sin. It makes a big deal about perfection. These two natures, I would like to expound more. And I'd like for each and every one of you to think which one you are. Which one seems to fit you more? Maybe it's the impure nature, the fleshly nature, or it's the holy nature, the spiritual nature, or with most, say, believers, it's both. So somewhere in this spectrum, everybody here, I can confidently say, you'll find yourself in this message. And I'd like for you to ask yourself which nature you feel more inclined to be and to do. And maybe it could be a little eye-opening and helpful to some. Will you pray with me, Father? Fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood. God, I need you. And uh, the couple here, the married couple needs you. And everybody else here needs you today. Will you take full control? And will you be honored and glorified? And the people receive a blessing both my church members and the newcomers, and especially the bride and groom. Will you, be uh, will you be glorified and honored and everyone be blessed? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I like to talk about something clean here. The clean linen. Something clean can go well with verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. See, when you have a very clean atmosphere, everybody just has a lighter mood. When things are cleaned, you see more of the beauty. When things are dirty, you don't see the beauty. When things are dirty, it puts a more oppressive mood or an oppressive spirit in the atmosphere. See, when you have something clean, you can truly rejoice. You can truly be happy. A lot of people... They might not understand sometimes how something so clean can be something so joyous. Some people think that it's the opposite, that if you have something too clean, that you're not going to be happy. And that sometimes something that's impure and unclean would bring more happiness. Well, for the fleshly nature, that's very understandable. But the spiritual nature is very different. You know, when I look at, uh, man, it's impressive what technology is doing right now. Obviously, it has its problems, and I'm sure a lot of you parents might struggle with that with your children now, where they're addicted to a screen, or maybe some of you parents are too. <laughs> so there is a huge problem with that. But there is a beauty, so to speak, and an understanding why people can be addicted or hooked onto the screen. You know why? Their eyes are attracted to the beauty. When you look at pictures nowadays, it's a lot different from 20 years ago even. The pictures are just such fine quality. It's high definition. I mean, certain lines, I mean, for real, certain lines that you see in the image is a lot more clear than what you see sometimes with your own eye. Sometimes that heavy definition iPhone and then the TV screen, especially if you get a big one, yeah. you're like just blown away, right? Some of you kids are like, you know, you get hooked onto those video games because, man, the, the characters, the environment, the settings is all done beautifully. It looks cool, so to speak. But why? Because they made it beautiful, because they made sure the image was clean enough for you to see that. But, you know, if the TV screen was dirtied, if it, you know, you get some stain on it, how can you honestly, grown adult or kid, sit down in front of that huge definition high screen TV, and I don't care how good of a quality it is, then you just see that awful stain throughout the whole time from beginning to end. 
You can't focus then on the screen. You can't enjoy all the beautiful imagery, uh, all the movements of the picture and the movie where it's telling you the story. You can't enjoy all of that. Why? Because the reason why is that all you're going to pay attention to is that stupid thing that's blocking everything. The clean person can only enjoy when can only enjoy, can have a good mood and see what he wants to see in that beautiful picture, if it's clean. If it's clean. But man, when there's something dirty there, it'll just ruin his whole mood. It'll kill his whole mood and he can't just enjoy the beauty behind the pictures and the movie because all he's going to focus is that block. And that just bothers him. It ruins the mood. But I'll tell you how you can uh, change the mood. You can change the mood no matter how bad quality the TV screen is if you're suffering blindness with your eyes. If a person is suffering eyesight or is blind, not a problem at all. For they're not going to focus on the dirt. For they cannot see the dirt. And that's not going to be concentrated throughout the whole movie. Because they could care less about looking at the beauty. Because they're never going to see it. So they prefer to making the best out of it. Enjoying and having a good mood without seeing the beauty. And they can do so. Maybe they can hear the sound from the TV screen. Maybe they can just be with their friends and enjoy it together. And maybe they can do what they can to have a good mood and still enjoy a good time because they're so used to having their vision blurred. They've been so used to that. They never saw beauty before. And because they're so used to a blurred vision, they'll be content. They'll be happy. They'll be in a good mood. They're satisfied with where they're at. See, to a clean Christian, holiness is so important. Purity is so important because it creates a good mood. For sin is depression. For sin is complaining. For sin is hatred. For sin is not getting along with people. For sin is not encouragement. And when you have something clean like joy, when you have something clean like peace, when you have something clean like overlooking people's faults and just loving one another, when you have something clean where I don't want a single blot or a stain to come upon my daily living, why? So that it won't kill my mood. So it won't destroy my joy in the Lord. Amen. So it won't make me depressed. Because sin always does that. That stain, that stain, you can make it small and you can try to not make a big deal out of it. But throughout that whole beautiful thing that God's trying to guide you in a clean life, all you're going to focus on is that stain, and that stain will rob you of answered prayers. That stain will rob you of your peace in God. That stain will rob you of finding real joy in Jesus Christ. But see, a person who's so blind in the dark, who's so spiritually blind in the dark, doesn't understand that. For their vision has always been blurred. And they never saw the beauty of what God did upon their lives. They never saw the beauty of being saved in Jesus Christ. They never saw the beauty of knowing that you can go to heaven after you die. They never saw the beauty of love with the brethren. They never saw the beauty of joy, peace, and love in the Holy Ghost. They never saw that beauty before. They never saw the beauty of preaching behind the Word of God as much as it blessed a clean person. They never saw the beauty of Him singing that blessed a clean person. They never could understand that. Why? Because all that time their vision was used to being blurred. 
So they're okay with it, see? It doesn't bother them. If they get a dirt and a stain, why would it bother them? For their eyesight is blurred already and they're blind, so they can't really see it. So they'll make the best out of something that's impure. They'll make the best about something imperfect. They'll make the best out of sin and still have a good mood about it. And they can enjoy sin and they can have a fun time and it pleases and satiates their flesh. Why? Because their vision has been blurred and the stain doesn't bother them. They never saw real beauty in Jesus Christ. They never knew what it was like. They never experienced that. So because of that, they could care less about the beauty of salvation, the beauty of being a Christian, the beauty of serving God. You know, something so clean is so powerful where you can see the beauty out of sacrifice and pain even. In the Christian life, the worst thing that can ever happen to him can still turn out to be something beautiful created by the ultimate storyteller, created by the ultimate artist. And what seems like sacrifice or pain or something ugly, an artist can take, it's a miracle, he can take something ugly or an ugly color or an ugly theme and turn it as part of a holistic, beautiful masterpiece. That's what a clean image, a clean artwork can do. That even with sacrifice and pain, it turns into beauty. And see, people who are blurred, they never understand how suffering brings God greater glory. They can never understand how sacrifice benefits a saved believer and make them more happy. They'll never understand that. Why? Because they never saw the beauty of the sacrifice. Why God tried to create the greatest beautiful picture of sacrifice with Jesus Christ when he died on the cross and there were even movies that made it so visible to the naked eye that they could see the power of love through such ugly sacrifice and the horror and the pain that Jesus Christ went through. And all the blinded world can simply say is it's too gory. It's too horrifying. I don't know why Christians get into that. That's the nature of a blinded person who never saw something clean. Let's look at the next one. It says white. And I believe that it fits well with verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. You know what white does? The, the whiteness of the garment right here is to display righteousness. That means it's supposed to expose any blots that might be there and get rid of it. If you get something that whitens your vision, if you get something that lightens up the whole thing, you ever put a white light? on somebody when you put on a when you shine a white light on somebody and then here am I I I look good right now but if you were to shine a white light on it due to this dark color it could hide it well but no matter how dark sometimes sometimes no matter how camouflaged the clothing might be if that light concentrates where the blot or the stain is, you're going to see it. See, uh, the white light exposes any blot or stain that anyone can easily overlook. And white light, when it lands on a surface or on your clothes, it can show you areas that you never thought were there. I remember, I mean, I always... Uh, try to dress my best when I go to church, but uh, I was shocked sometimes when I would wear it, and you know I don't see any problems or stains. 
and then when I go underneath a white light as I'm trying to get ready and that light is like really like shining down on my suit, all of a sudden I see several stains here and I go, oh my goodness. I was like, why didn't I see that before? And I get so ashamed and I, because I don't want people to see it. So then I try to get rid of it. But see, if I don't have the whiteness of light, there is no shame at all. There is no shame for it cannot be seen. If the room was dark, if there were no lights, how can anyone see how nasty the stain is and how big the stain is as long as there's no light and the room is always dark? See, a person who's in a dark room is never going to understand what the stain looks like, how ugly the stain is, and how actually big the stain is, or maybe even how serious that stain is, and they want to get rid of that so badly. They'll never understand that as long as you get rid of that white light. As long as the room is dark, you'll be perfectly fine. And there is no shame, no guilt in the heart. And when you go around and socialize with people, there is no shame about your stain. Even if you got a hundred stains all over you, as long as it's dark, the room, and there is no whiteness of light, then you can go fine with a free conscience and just do whatever you want. No stain will bother you. Get that white light there, though. Then seriousness starts to set in. You were never serious before because you were just enjoying eating the food that you want to eat, even if it's splattered all over your clothes. You were just simply enjoying a good time. But then once that whiteness of light sets in, all of a sudden your mood changes. Your mood gets ruined. You feel hurt, maybe even offended, because you go, wow, this food cause this stain on my clothes. Normally, wouldn't people, after seeing the white light on their clothes and seeing the stains, they turn into seriousness. And they turn into, let me clean that up. And they turn into, let's get rid of those things. But as long as there is no white light and the person never saw what the white light exposed, you can always remain happy the way you are. Take life lackadaisically, if there is such a word. <laughs> Not a care in the world, and why is that stain a big issue? Why is that sin a big issue? I don't get it. See, that, that sin is not that serious. You're making a big deal. Well, maybe, I'll admit, maybe the sin is little. Maybe there is sin, but come on, it's so little. No one can really see it. I mean, why are you making a big deal out of it? And then while you're saying that, there's like 10 more different stains that you overlooked. Why? Because you never saw the whiteness of the light. You never experienced what it was like being in the whiteness of the light. And that's okay because you can remain feeling good and keep enjoying life and nothing will ruin your mood as long as that whiteness of light doesn't point out what stains you have. In your life. That's why sometimes people can get upset at preachers, right? Sometimes people can get upset at the Word of God because the Bible says the Word of God is a light, a lamp for our feet. The Bible says that the Christian's life and living is a light itself. And no wonder the world gets mad about that, right? No wonder the fleshly ma nature gets so offended and upset at those holier-than-thou Christians. They always have to shine a white light on me and tell me that I have a thousand things I have to fix up in my life. How dare they? Or, or, perhaps they can see, wow, this is more serious than I thought. Oh, wow, I need to get rid of these things as soon as possible. Oh man, this food that I've been eating, I'm mad at it because this food caused the stain on my clothes. 
I'm so mad at sin. Why do I keep eating sin? Why do I keep feasting in sin? Why do I keep splattering my clothes with sin? I'm sick and tired of it. I'm angry with it. I'm never going to touch that thing again. A person can only say that when they're under the whiteness of the light. And the natural inclination is to take sin seriously. But there's another person that could care less. And the natural inclination is, let me just eat whatever I want to eat and let us splatter my clothes for all I care. Because I can't see it. It's not that serious to me. Because why? The room is dark in here and all I can feel right now is the good taste of that food that I'm eating. And when you get the, you know what the funny thing is once you have a white garment? What makes you more upset about a white garment is that a white shows the stain more easily. And then when you combine that with sunlight, oh boy, you thought you cleaned it up real good. You thought that you got all the wrinkles out and then all those stains out. And then when that sunlight shone on you, you're like, oh my goodness. And you're like, what? That's there? That's there? I thought I put it under a white light. But see that white light, uh, it's, just, it's small. It's not that big, see? Compared to the sun, the sun is like everywhere. When that sun shines down on you, then it shows you, you thought that you were pure enough. But here are some impurities you still need to fix. No, you're not that holy like you think you are. You're not that pure like you think you are. And at the judgment seat of Christ, when the Son of Righteousness, and that's Jesus Christ, shines on your life, then you realize, oh my, I thought I was a good Christian. I thought that I pleased the Lord. Oh, th I thought, I thought, I thought. And then your pride is what made it dark to you. Your light was not big enough. It was small. If only you yielded and you humbled yourself and stopped being prideful and yielded to the sun's light rather than your light and yielded to the sun's light and let the sun expose all the impurities and the imperfections. But see, you kept resisting the sun. You kept going to your shade underneath the tree. Your shade, because it's cool there, it's comfortable. And you fled back to your shade and used the excuse of because of trauma. That's why I want to hide underneath the shade. Because of suffering, I want to hide underneath my shade. Because of the sun is too pure for me. They think that they're better than me. I want to hide underneath my shade and keep looking at your white garment and think that you're still okay and right with God. The last part is verse 9. Verse 9. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. See, uh, God is speaking to all the people who are coming to the wedding and saying, come on over. You can come and you'll receive a blessing out of the marriage supper. He said blessed. When God puts a blessing, that's eternal. That's permanent. He says, these are the true sayings of God. You know what that means? That's eternal. That means it will last. Fine, high quality should last for a long time. And that goes to the last part of verse 8. Fine linen. If you got something that's so fine and high quality, that's going to last. You know, I was, uh, sometimes I get amazed when I go to third world countries or even in the homeless areas here in America 
And here are people who are suffering run down, poor quality homes and clothes and everything, even their own uh, sanitation. And it's very sad, it's very unfortunate. But you know, I was very shocked when I went to thir some third world places and then they got run down homes and then I see TV antennas, satellite dishes. I see poor people having an iPhone in their hand. <laughs> and I go, what in the world? Where do they get that from? How do they do that? <laughs> Man, they had to pay a huge price to <laughs> get a fine quality phone, a fine quality TV. They, they paid a hefty price for that. And man, that hefty price costed them a poor quality lifestyle, a poor quality living situation to the very own garments that they wear and dress. Poor quality. Why? Because it was worth it. It was worth it that much to them. Well, what about the rundown house? You know, what about your clothes? And you smell and, you know, you poor you, poor you. Don't you think that you should get more? Don't you think that the money could be better spent on that? That your effort could be better spent on something that you can have a little better quality? But no, when there's something you love so much, you want to keep that thing and you're willing to pay all the price for the thing you love and be willing to go through any poor quality, horrible condition in life. And see, when you're addicted to sin, boy, it's such fine quality to you. And you could care less if your living situation is poor, is rough. You know what sin always did to you? Sin always made you pay a hefty price of family instability. Now your kids are following your bad example too. Sin costed divorce. And sin, it costed your peace. It zapped away your strength of enduring hardships in life. Sin was such a hefty price to pay. But see, sin was worth it to you, wasn't it? You're willing to pay any price. And you're willing to suffer poor, horrible conditions as long as you got the fine taste of sin. But you know what's worse about sin? It, it pretends to be high quality when it's not. TV and iPhones, those pictures, they're not real life. They're fantasy. They're not real. But see, you pretend it's real. You make it real to you. And that's what sin does. Sin is so fake and deceptive but it's not real. It's not the genuine article. And the evidence to all that is after you watch everything on the screen, it just passes away. It don't last for eternity. Even if you had an equipment for years, it's only a short time duration. I don't care if you have the same TV screen or cell phone for 40 years, Guess what? Sin always keeps changing. And you'll need a new update. You'll need to buy a newer sin. You, why? Because to maintain your joy, your love, your addiction, you have to keep paying a more expensive cost for a higher quality of sin, which duration is temporary. See, sin is, not, is never satisfactory because you'll always seek for more. And you always seek for something new, a new update of sin. And guess what? You thought you paid the price. Listen, you thought you paid the price for your sin and you can enjoy it the rest of your life. You got tricked. Get ready to pay another hefty price when that sin gets old on you. See, you thought that your job, your family, your money, your everything, or your sin... Brought you joy, but why are you keep chasing after more now? Why do you keep updating your sin? Saving enough money to pay another hefty price for the new sin. Sin never satisfies, and sin 
is temporary. It'll always change. But my fine quality to a saved believer, (laughs) fine quality to a Christian who lives holy and pure for God, fine quality is such a hefty price to pay. It's a hefty price to pay. But guess what? When you pay for that expensive home, that can go for a lifetime. When you pay for that expensive clothes, that can last for a very long time. When you pay for some, a product or an item that can go for many, many years, it was worth the hefty price. But heaven is not a long duration. It's eternal duration. It lasts forever. For here you are and... You know, the world gives its greatest quality, but it'll, it can only last for a lifetime at best. But even it's not a lifetime. To be more honest, it's more seasonal. You have to seek for something new. But even at very best, it's a lifetime. But how small is lifetime compared to eternity? For when you look at the 100 years of your life, if you were to be so fortunate to live that long, in the best, exquisite lifestyle in the world, why 100 years is like a blink of an eye to a billion years long. And for heaven throughout all eternity, can you imagine a hefty price was paid? Jesus Christ, he paid it with this sacrifice. So now you can go to heaven, but now you get rewards. And you had to pay the hefty price. You had to live for God. You had to live holy. You had to uh, check your walk with Jesus Christ. And as you kept on serving God, you paid a hefty price. But when you go to heaven, friend, woo, you got your money's worth. Boy, it was expensive what you gave up. Boy, it was a sacrifice. My, my, my. As you entered into eternity and you expected a nice home, You gave up your condo, your house, which can only have a small acre of land in the San Francisco Bay Area, for a mansion with acres and acres of land. And when you look at that, the mansion is uh, like really a mansion. And you get so amazed and drawn. I mean, what, uh, 20 bedrooms, balconies. It's got the best view of the spot. And the greatest marble, the greatest gold, and the greatest architecture and design built by the greatest artist and architecture, Jesus Christ. And all the greatest architectures in this world, people thought, man, I love doing the museum tour or the house tour of that place because, wow, I loved how they built those gardens. I loved how they built those pillars. I loved how they built that bedroom and that house. Oh, I wish I could live there. Brother, sister in Christ, if you serve the Lord Jesus Christ, you got much more than that. And man, the joy, oh, the joy. The joy comes in. And you look all around you, and it's too late. You can't go back. You're stuck in heaven. It's eternal. It's fixed. You can't go back. You can't get get yourself kicked out of heaven if you wanted to. You already paid the hefty price. And the receipt is right there. The evidence is there that it's been paid for. And here you are. Now it's stuck with you for all eternity. And here you are. The, The pain is past. The sorrow is past. The payment payday is over. It's gone. It's done. No more payment, no more sacrifice, no more suffering. And now all you can enjoy is pure bliss. And you've only entered the threshold of eternity after 100 years of living there. And out there then you see the river of life. And my, what a beautiful river. My, what a beautiful waterfall. My, my, look at the universe, the stars and the galaxies out there. Wow, I thought the gardens on this earth was so beautiful. I thought Yosemite was beautiful. My my eye hath not seen, neither hath my ear heard, neither the things entered into my heart, the things that God hath prepared.
prepared for them that love him. And my, I got fine quality. Oh, such fine quality. And fine quality demands something clean. Oh, there's no litter. Oh, there's no garbage, no smell, no crime, no nothing. It's so clean. Vision is 2020. My blinded eyes have been opened. Oh my, why have I been blinded to the world's riches for so long? Why did I why was I satisfied for fifth rated quality when I could have had the first rated one? Oh my, my I see it now. My, these crowns are beautiful. My, the gold, silver, precious stones is better than a billion dollars. My, my, the place, the mansion that I have is worth more than any other mansion on this earth. My the life, the place that I live in. Oh, what joy. Oh, what joy. And it's so clean. You see it. And the stuff that you played in video games and the things that you fantasized as you were addicted on your phone, you're now living in it. And better than that, it's so, so much more designed and built better than what man can design and build on a screen. You're living in it and God's creation is far better than that. My, my. And the whiteness of the light showed the purity and any and every bless God any and every sin any small impact imperfection, any disappointment that you ever made, any mistake that you've done, and I mean in every and any sin or small little blot is blotted out by the white light of Jesus Christ so that's why there's no sorrow. It's been blotted out. There's no pain. It's been blotted out. There's no suffering. It's been blotted out. There's no death. It's been blotted out. I see it now. I see it now. Wouldn't anyone want to live for that? Wouldn't anyone want to live for that? Every head bow and every eye shut.